Hi, and welcome back to the Bold and Blissful Women Summit, where we help you connect with your feminine essence to create the extraordinary life and love you desire. Today, we have Nikki Michelle Sue from the Happiness Button. I'm so excited to have you here. Could you share a little bit with the audience what is it that you're currently doing and a little bit about your message? Hi, Nicole. Um, thank you for having me here, firstly. What I do is I help women who are perfectionists and the odd control freak or two to find more ease and fulfillment in life and, and connection also. And the happiness button is dedicated to helping women to rise up in, in their world, you know, whether it's in their personal lives or in their work lives, to find more ease and and just to feel more alive and to have more pleasure in their lives. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wanted to ask you, so I think we've all been there, right? We all have our tendencies of wanting to be perfect, wanting to control things. Um, are they the same thing? The desire to be perfect and the desire to control? They're really similar. You know, I kind of use those terms interchangeably sometimes. But I do know that when we are trying to get it right, you know, there are some perfectionists who try to get it right, and there are some perfectionists who are actually afraid of getting it wrong. And, and it's all, you know, in, in one of my videos, I talk about um, the reasons why we're a perfectionist. And for some people, that's control. And for other people, it's actually an attempt to keep themselves safe, you know, either on a conscious level or on a deeper unconscious level. So it's, it's an interesting area. I love that. Can you explore that a little bit further when you first started saying that, how, how do you recognize whether it's a fear of failure or it's a fear of success? Hmm. So, so yes, there is a fear, it's a fear of failing, there's a fear, a fear of getting it wrong. And then on the other side, there is a, I need to get it right. Mm -hmm. Or I need to make it feel right. It's not even about getting it wrong. It's about I need to make it feel right. And and I love because I draw from a lot of Chinese medicine, psycho um, psychology, and in, in, in the work I've been doing for the past fifteen years. And there's a few different archetypes in that model. Mm -hmm. And one of the archetypes is the fire element. That's when you want to make it feel right. That's when you need to get it right. And you end up being a perfectionist or a control freak because your ultimate motivation is it has to feel right. Contrast that to the water archetype where it's, it's something about, it's, it's fear driven, right? And it might be the fear of, of failure or it might be the fear of being rejected or it might be the fear of there's something wrong with me, you know, which is one of the big, it's fear of something wrong with me and fear of I'm not enough, I'm not doing enough, I'm not good enough. That's some of the driving motivations there. And they look like very similar things. But, you know, because I work with women quite deeply, um, it's useful to trace where, what the cause is because then, you know, you know, you do different things in different situations. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. What's coming up for me is asking you about, you know, I'm sure that a lot of women out there are thinking at this moment, like what, you know, wanting to be perfect, like there's there's nothing wrong with that, or I just like things to go my way. Um, is there anything, or is there a ne negative connotation around wanting things to be perfect, or, or not? I think perfectionism is one of the greatest teachers you can have. So, you know, I, I don't see things as black and white. I see the gifts of perfectionism and I also see the liabilities of perfectionism. The gifts are obvious. You know, so many high achievers I know are high achievers because they've had this perfectionism that's been really driving them hard for all the, you know, for so many decades of their lives. And, and it seems like because of that, that's what's driven them to achieve really amazing things. And there's a flip side of that as well. As well, because it gets a point where it's unproductive. Perfectionism actually costs us. That's costing you, you know. And and some of those things that cost you are, you know, so many women. Going a little tangent here. So many women I know go, I do my best work under pressure, you know. Mm -hmm. But and perfectionism is one of those things that actually puts pressure on 
ourselves when we do that. So when we're under that much pressure, yes, there's a certain amount of stress that's productive stress, but then perfectionism can very easily tip us over into unproductive zone. You know, our brain function actually starts to be suboptimal. It doesn't work as well as it could be. And for many of these women that I, that I know, they're so smart that they don't really notice it. They're still getting by. But there actually is a cost. They're functioning at a fraction of what their true potential is. Um, add to that the, the cost of the stress, the anxiety. That one, like, one woman I was working with saying, there's joylessness, <laughs> you know? There's the anxiety and the stress, and there's joylessness. It, it, me working this way, me working this way in my mindset is actually costing me joy. It's costing me spontaneity. Um, so there's, there's a few things that actually bite us in the ass, so to speak, when we are being a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And for the really smart women out there, they don't really notice that because they've got so much, they're so smart. But the, the main point here is they're not functioning at the true potential. You know, women I know who are perfectionists also don't put their hands up for that big project or that big promotion. There's a sense of, well, if I do that, it's going to be so easy to get it wrong or be making mistakes or it's too far in my stretch. How do I stay on top of things? How do I be perfect if I, you know, if I take on that big thing? So they hold themselves back. You know, there's a classic yeah. thing where they joke about how men just go, yes, I'll do it. And women go, um, can I? Am I qualified? Can I do exactly everything in that job description? <laughs> so it's a little bit of that kind of thinking. Two mm. questions. More than five came up for me, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so let me just remember yeah. that. I wanted, just to clarify, if I don't remember, please remember remember me to tell you about this whole like job description thing. I have a question around that. So first, I keep hearing you mention that they're not functioning from their full potential. Yeah. Why is that? Well, we're going to get... I'm going to keep this as ungeeky as I can, but what neuroscience tells us is that when we're under that kind of stress, and you know, having worked with so many women over years, what I notice is that our, that their survival reactions are firing up. You know, things like fight or flight, things like oh my gosh, bad things are happening, or you know, I have to avoid bad things happening. Um, fear, all of these things are survival reactions. I mean, and what neuroscience tells us is that when we have survival reactions. Um, they happen in the amygdala in our brain, and when that happens, the blood flow to our higher brain actually significantly decreases. They see this in like MRI scans, right? Which means there's less blood flow, which means there's less function. And our higher brain is responsible for things like rational thinking, <laughs> creative problem solving, putting things in context, all the things that are really useful when we're, you know, when we're under pressure, when we're trying to create something amazing and, and powerful. So just that on its own will actually, you know, stop us from being truly great. And there's there's a deeper aspect to us as well. Can I share a story with you about this? Go ahead. Great. Yeah. I remember being in college because I, I went to a really unusual college that taught us everything about psychology and anatomy and physiology and, and energetic sciences as well. And I remember one of my um, the class was about brain function and in that particular class I was having such a really hard time um, nothing the lecturer was saying was getting in in one year at the other and he said he got to a point where said, okay let's get a class subject we're gonna do a live demo so I put my hand up immediately I'm like yes pick me I'm having such a hard time and he does and I get up there and he, he's you know he's kind of unpacking me live in front of all my classmates, which is an incredibly intimate and vulnerable, vulnerable. experience. To have. Yeah, because it was interesting because I thought it's just brain function, right? It's just my brain and how it works. But what he unpacked was um, early childhood issues, belief systems, mindset pieces, you know, that from my past that were really holding me back. And for some reason, it, and it showed me how 
that. It gave me a real life personal experience of how that was actually affecting my brain function in that class there and then. Plus the fact that all of it was being, you know, displayed and, and, and revealed to my classmates, which actually um, heightened those issues that were being brought up about vulnerability and, and, and not being able to be in control and all those kinds of things. So, right. so you yeah, that was you my You couldn't experience. control the other people's reaction or um, thought about what was going on in the moment. Yeah, and, and look, that was a, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this story because it's a really important message here too. So, so many perfectionists are afraid of how will other people see me? You know, that whole imposter syndrome thing. You know, I think I'm not really great, so I have to work really hard to keep it all together and try to look like I'm doing okay, but really I don't think I'm doing okay, so I have to work even harder. It's, it's kind of like a vicious cycle in that way. Um, and that's what I was experiencing. I'm like, hang on, I can't keep things together anymore. It's all being revealed to my classmates. And as a, as a you know, I'm, I call myself a surviving, a recovering perfectionist. And I was very much a perfectionist back then. That was really confronting for me, having all my vulnerabilities be exposed and, and revealed like that. Thank you so, so much. I can totally relate. I just had a situation like that before our interview. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So uh, as we were talking, I was like, whoa. Um, I think that came up for me as I were, was hearing you talk was, so can you describe what does it look like for a woman to f fully function from you know, her full potential? Mm. There are so many ways of looking at that. The way I really prefer is when we've replaced perfectionism and being a control freak with just being a high achiever. And that being a high achiever could be in the world of work, if that's what we choose, or it could be in the world of our community, you know, our family, our tribe, or, or the community at large. So we're replacing perfectionism with, being, with doing great things. And, and when you're a perfectionist, you know, that comes with anxiety, joylessness, um, and stress. On this side of the spectrum, when you're just achieving great things and you're tuned into your purpose, there's ease and fulfillment. And there is a certain kind of joy, joy of life. And, and that's, that's actually a practice you have to cultivate. You know, that's not just a mindset piece, but it's a lifestyle practice as well. Because we're talking ease, we're talking about fulfillment. I mean, what I believe is that is that it that's just a couple of things, and those words on their own seem really abstract. But to be in flow is how I describe it. To to have to be lit up in your body and to feel alive and to feel like you're celebrating a certain sense of of joy and love and pleasure. You know, and sensuality, not in a sexy kind of way, although, hey, if you put your hand up for that too, great. But sensuality in terms of being turned on to what's happening around you, being turned on to what's happening within you, and very much feeling alive. Beautiful. Beautiful. I wanted to, to highlight something that you said that I didn't mention before. I thought it was so fascinating when you said that when, when women tell you that they kind of function better when they're under pressure, yeah. and then your whole explanation showed otherwise, right? Yeah. I, just, I just thought that was so beautiful because I have been there and I've had to come to a place where I realize, okay, so I see that I have a tendency, right? Of I used to have this tendency of always doing things at the last minute because I felt like I got things better in the moment, or if I had a test, if I had anything, like I would study right before I went to sleep when I felt like the rush of the deadline, all that sort of stuff, and that's what I thought got me functioning in a good way, but then after the fact, I felt like super exhausted, yeah. depleted, um, it was kind of like a, a highs and lows, highs and lows all the time, and I don't think it was doing great to my body, to, to, you know, to my own mm -hmm. sense of well-being. So I think that was a good thing to, to mention. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to ask you, can, yeah, sure, please. Um, can I add something to what you've just described? Now, I think this is really 
Because I think this will be really valuable to the women out there who are listening. Um, it's it's that cycle as you as you talk about, right? And we get so addicted to. I mean, we when I say addicted, our strategy is that we're used to um, our nervous system rattling in a certain speed at a certain you know over idling kind of really high speed frequency, and and you get things done. And at some point, that association forms in our mind, and we go, oh, well, that's how I get all these things done. That combination of the high emotion and all the hormones, the stress hormones running in our body creates that association. And then after that, we go, well, that's how it is. And then we start creating those situations for ourselves, even if it doesn't exist in the environment around us. And then we go from that thing from like, you know, high energy, high pressure, frantic activity, nervous energy activity. And then we go, we can't sustain that. So we go into a oh, relax, you know, kind of a much lower energy state. And then we go, okay, time to kick ass and get into gear again. And then we go back and forth and back and forth into those things and trap that we fall into, um, which, which I think, which I believe we can actually get out of and step out of with, you know, if we cultivate practices for ourselves, um, which we can talk about later. But yeah, I just I wanted to add that. It's such a common experience for women. I love that. And um, I do want us to get back at that later because I think that would be of like great value to all the women um, that are watching this interview. Going back to my question or the question that I wanted to ask you on, you know, job description. I once saw on a TV program they were, they were doing like this exam between like women and men when, you know, their reactions when they saw a job description, right? Yeah. And if, you, if the man saw like a job description that was written in like a really hard way, like this is a hard demanding job that requires this, this and this and the other, you know, a man was more, um, he was more comfortable in raising his hand and saying that he was capable of doing it even though he had no idea on how to do it. But a woman would be like, oh, no, that a woman would normally choose a more soft-spoken job description role. And that's kind of like why, why there, there were always like more men you know, on higher roles and that women were always like, you know, um, not allowing some, themselves to grow that way. Like self-imposing all yeah. these sort of like limiting thoughts around that. Do you have anything to share on that and like what could be the reason of that or any thoughts or insights? And inter it's interesting because I, I can think of a few men that I've worked with that actually, you know, they'll put their hands up for the job and then they'll get in the job and then they get confronted with all their perfectionist tendencies and and, and then, they, then they, they go, well, I'm going to put my hand up for that first and then I'll deal with that later. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, it's it's for women. That's not happening for some reason. Um, it's it's interesting. I mentioned imposter syndrome earlier, and and imposter. Um, have you heard of imposter syndrome? Yes. It's, yeah. So Google it if, you, if for the listeners out there and watch just Google it if you haven't seen it. It's but really powerful. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it really captures the zeitgeist because in a couple of the most intelligent professions that women are in, which is like law and academia, there's a really high percent, like 60 or 70 percent of women in those fields, some studies suggest, actually feel that they have imposter syndrome. So academics and lawyers, we're talking about some of the most clever women, you know, in our society, and, and they have that. Um, and having worked with a few people with imposter syndrome, when you, unpack, when you start to unpack that, what I discover is, is a certain, is that combination of being a perfectionist and being a control freak. Um, it's, and it's either that fear of failure or the fear of being found out for not being good enough or that there's something wrong with them, or that sense of, I need to get it right. And it's really hard to get it right in a new job that has a job description, which is, you know, a lot outside your comfort zone. And, and there is something here as well. And I wonder if, you know, everyone has issues dealing with their comfort zone. But I, I do wonder what's happening with that. You know, if men are putting their hands up and women aren't doing that so much for those jobs. I wonder, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, but I wonder, how are women dealing with going outside their comfort zone that way? 
Well, I remember personally be- when I first saw that. <clears throat> when I first saw that inter- uh, interviewer show, I wasn't a coach back then. I was still a project manager, um, and I saw it and I got so fired up because I actually had a job position in front of me. And they were always, yeah. everybody was telling me, well, this is the hardest, you know, job or, you know, group in this company. Are you sure that you can do it? And then I was like, mm, well, I don't know, because it's like so hard. And then, I, I, like, will I be able to, you know, to do a, a good job? Like, I had all those questions going on in my mind. And then I saw the program, and I was like, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm going to do this. And I showed up, and I got it. And I got it. It was very interesting, but it was a good eye opener in the moment because I could see myself reflected on what they were were, were talking at the moment. But it's so yeah. it's so it's so fascinating. So I wanted to ask you. Yeah. What? Okay. So how can a person start to recognize that you know they have perfectionist tendencies? In the moment. Okay. That's a really interesting question. And I have to confess, I am a recovering perfectionist. And as I've been, you know, getting, shooting all these videos and, and doing lots of things in the past few months, I, I can see myself going, how do I make this really good? How do I make this even better? And I know for me, I have a joy of, of making things even better. Um, but what, what clues me on to, hey, is this healthy or unhealthy, is my feeling state. And this requires a certain level of awareness because I see some women um, who are quite oblivious to that. Their whole entire physiology, their body language, their voice, and the tension behind their eyes is really stressed. But they're like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> you know? yeah. But for yeah. me, the, the giveaway is I'm actually stressed. You know, there is that tension in my body, behind my eyes, um, my heart rate, you know, and, and how I'm feeling is my, is my, I can, my um, what do you call it, guide, you know, am I, am I still in the joy of doing something that's amazing and wonderful as a gift and as a contribution or am I doing it because I need to get it right <laughs> and I, I want it to be the best thing and the most perfect thing and it, you know, that's, I think it's a feeling state. So I'd say to the women out there, listen to that, tune into that, um, cultivate more body awareness and, and feeling awareness to that. Can you and of course, expand it, more on body awareness? Yeah. Um, when we're a perfectionist or a control freak, it's so easy for us to like be functioning from here up. <laughs> You know, and there's all the rest of it here that we kind of cut off from ourselves. You know, I particularly if you're a woman who's been working in a high pressure job so much, and even when you get home and you try to unwind, you have those glasses of wine, etc. Um, it's yeah, you're, you're functioning at this constantly. You know, your nervous system is constantly functioning at a really high frequent oh, not high frequency but uh it's overworking it's going at working over time basically so it's difficult to be you know when we're functioning at that level when your nervous system's functioning over time stress hormones all over the place it's really it's more difficult to cultivate that awareness unfortunately because your body drop you drop into it it's like it's unpleasant it doesn't feel good so you bring your focus somewhere else you bring your focus somewhere else so part of this process of cultivating awareness is actually taking care of yourself in a really holistic way it's about finding the resources that can help you calm down it's about you know getting getting the help and support um to calm that down or or to have a facilitated support so that you can be with that and then and learn how to work with that and learn how to calm that down um, and there are many ways um, to do that some are, are more pharmaceutical approaches which I'm not sure they deal with the underlying cause but there are also a lot of different things like you know massage aromatherapy acupressure acupuncture um, or mindset pieces and I could, I could so get into this whole thing about mindfulness and awareness training programs right now because so many perfectionists 
do mindfulness training and awareness training, it makes them aware of that. Over time, stress hormones, oh my gosh, I'm a mess on the inside. And because if you're a perfectionist, mindfulness or awareness practice is just making more aware of what's wrong with you. <laughs> without, without giving you that support for actually dealing with that. So it's, I have nothing against mindfulness or awareness programs and training programs. I just think it needs to kind of go that step further for perfectionists and that. help them bridge that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Did I answer your question? I remember now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And I, I wanted to ask you as well, because I know that we mentioned it before, uh, ways so that we can, instead of going like up and down all the time, the highs and lows, you know, what are those ways in which a woman can actually support herself in this journey of, you know, learning yeah. to do things with more ease and more flow? Yeah. Luke, excuse me a second. I just need to sneeze. I know. <laughs> it's okay. Oops. Really vulnerable <laughs> moment here. <laughs> yes, when you when you see my snot and, and bodily functions, hello, human, totally human and not some perfect alabaster sculpture or whatever. Um, okay, so what was the question again? <laughs> Go sure. With um, it, the question was, you know, how do, how do you support yourself as a woman uh, yeah. from, go, from going of a place of being in highs and lows all the time to a place of more, you know, um, flow? Yeah, it's, this is a really juicy subject, you know, and, and having worked one-on-one -on -one with people for the past 15 years, I've, I've done so many, it, it's often quite different for, the details are different for each person, but in that period of time, I've noticed that there are, are three commonalities, you know, three general themes that really help women who are in that situation. The first step is to actually arrive and, and to, you know, some people say, you know, finding yourself. I call it arrive because you don't go around finding yourself. You arrive, you come home to who you really are. And, and that sense of self that you come home to is the foundation for, for a, a lot of things. It's a foundation you know, when you are really inhabiting your true self and you're really being your true self. Um, you know, you're not what you do. You're not how well you do it. You're not whether you get it right, you're not whether you do it right or do it perfectly. You're just a sense of you. You're not the mistakes that you make. You're not the things that go wrong around you that have absolutely nothing to do with you. <laughs> you know, and so many women I know go, oh my gosh, things are bad happening over there. It must have something to do with me. That's why I say that. So the, the upside of the, the benefit of doing this is that it gives you a, self -self, a sense of self-assurance you know who you are and I have clients say to me and these words are these, these words keep coming back and like from what my clients say I'm me I know who I am I know I'll be okay even if you know shit hits the fan excuse the French okay. <laughs> even okay. if things go really wrong I know I'll be okay and that's that's the the benefit of that first step of arriving coming home to who you really are and part of that process, the next step, part of that process for the second step is about accepting. You know, I, I told you before about perfectionists do mindfulness and awareness programs. They go, oh my gosh, are all these things that are wrong with me? What do I do about that? Well, at acceptance is the antidote here. You know, if you're a perfectionist, if you beat yourself up about it constantly, constantly the things you have or haven't done, this is the antidote. If you think there's something wrong with you, on the inside, acceptance is also the key to finding a way out of that. You know, it's just like, first, you arrive, you be yourself, then step two, you have to love yourself and accept yourself. Otherwise, what, what's that for? You know, and then loving yourself, accepting yourself really creates this foundation, you know, for like, well, things can go wrong, things can go pear-shaped, but... <sighs> I'm okay, <laughs> you know, I still love and accept myself anyway. And, and I, wanna, I wanna say something about this because loving and accepting ourselves, there are words that are bandied around so frequently, you know, and, and it's so easy to say, I, I see women go, oh yeah, I love myself, but I don't, somehow, you know, they say those words and, and they think those words, but 
I'm not, I, I'm not feeling them feel those words. I'm not feeling them live those words. Mm. You know, it's mm. like this knowing the path and then this walking the path. And, and I believe that it's... They know it up here. They know, yeah. But they're not feeling it in their body. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And it's like, how do you love yourself when your nervous system, you know, because I, I, see, I see each of us as a human system that's not just our mind. So how, if you're a perfectionist, if you're doing that kind of if your survival reactions are going um, and your nervous system is like overworking here, how... It's actually really difficult to love and accept yourself and, and you need to actually get, there are some key pieces of that that need to happen in your body because your nervous system is not your mind, it's your, it's your body. Well, it's not just your mind, it's, it's your body as well. So there are some key pieces of loving and accepting yourself that go beyond mindset, that go beyond um, just talking about it and just knowing it, as you say, yeah. And actually has to be here in the body. Um, and, and that's the second part of it. Um, there's a third part of it as well, but I don't know if you have any questions for me about what I've said so far. I wanted to add something. Basically, you know, I believe in this whole like energy thing and, you know, projections, reflections, all this sort of stuff. And in my own experience, the more accepting I am of myself, the more uh, you know, the more the other, others are for me, right? Mm -hmm. I see that reflected. Whenever I'm being too hard on myself, you know, back then my boss would be harder on myself. When I was mm -hmm. more accepting of myself, he would take it okay, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He would encourage me. So it's all about, for me personally, softening on the inside. Mm -hmm. And if you do encounter someone that's too hard on yourself, to not get defensive about it, to be able to get to that place of inner peace, inner calm, where you know their opinion of you has nothing to do with your state of being. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and I, I love what you're saying, and, and what it makes me think of, and it's a vulnerability piece, you know, and it's 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 essentially what you're talking about as well. Um, how can we be with with that and be okay with it? Um, and it's interesting because when we see someone resisting vulnerability because they don't want that to be seen by others, it actually makes them stand out even more as something's not quite right there. <laughs> Whereas, you know, you if we actually... That? Yeah. So I think with, when you look around you, you think about the women you see around you, um, you'll, you'll, you might have seen someone with your friends or workmates kind of really struggle and they're trying to get it right and they're keeping it all and they don't want to talk about it, they're just trying to get past it. You know, they're trying to get past that fear, they're trying to get past that insecurity, they're trying to get past it. But what that energy creates, or what the energy that creates is a resistance, not flow. Mm -hmm. And that kind of resistance stands out like a sword. You know, we think it doesn't, we're actually trying to hide it, or they're trying to hide it, but it has the opposite effect. And That's contrast, true. you know That's what I'm talking true. about, right? You've seen people try to do that. Um, it's kind of like that saying that says, what you resist persists. Yeah. So whatever you're yeah. defensive about, it's, it's going to show up. Yeah. And it persists as a shining beacon of, hello, something's not quite right there. And I, I can't, the opposite of that, if you didn't do that, if you did something else, if, you know, and vulnerability is an easy thing. And one of the things I talk about in my program is finding the easiest, most enjoyable way to be vulnerable. And, um, you know, let's, let's, let's acknowledge that vulnerability is, you know, there's fear involved and it's not always easy. It's, if it was, it wouldn't be called vulnerability. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I came to this insight myself recently and I, and I made a video about it because we think it's like, I'm either going to be vulnerable and this is just the mindset thing that most women I talk to have and I have, I had to myself at one point in time. It's like, I'm either going to be um, strong and fixing it and taking care of things or I'm going to be a mess. 
and it's one or the other, and I have to choose, mm. right? And mm. it's it's a tough choice. And I've always been a fan of having my cake and eating it. So, <laughs> you know, and but for myself, you know, just like last week, I caught myself having that black and white thinking it has to be one or the other, and and. And it's like, ah, oh, okay, well, I'm human. There you go. So there is a way, you know, and that's beyond this. Rather than going from choosing one or the other, let's, what, what if we have the best of both worlds? I'm going to, what if we were somewhere here, on top here? Rather, and here we can have the best of what's happening here. We can be vulnerable. We and we can feel what we feel. And it's interesting because when you feel what you feel, all of a sudden you're more connected. You're more embodied. And and you're not pushing, putting that pressure on yourself to get it right or to be perfect or to be superhuman or something. And as that pressure falls away, your brain function goes, ah, oh, okay, work it. Work it, nothing again. And just because when you're here, just because you're doing this, doesn't mean you also can't do this. You can resolve things and get things done. You can do both of these things at the same time, and 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 that's a really nice spot to be in. You know, that's you're you're vulnerable, but you're still doing what you need to do. And logically, at first, it's like an oxymoron. How do I do that? But that's that's the way. You don't have to choose between these two. It's actually here. So that's thank you for letting me share that with you. It's, that's so beautiful. It's, it's, yeah. And um, thing was coming up for me basically. It was control. The need to control. That's something that we could expand on. Um, yeah. What are the common definitions? or the common reasons why a person would want or desires to control the outcome of a situation? <sighs> control is so easily confused with, <clears throat> excuse me, control is easily confused with just getting things done. You know, control is like, yeah, this is how I function. I, if I don't do this, if I, if I don't fix things, if I don't be in control, then it'll just be a mess, for example. So the reasons for being in control I, um, would be, you know, and I, I, go, I go deep. And the, and the deep reasons are, you know, fear of failure, there's something wrong with me. Um, I need to make it right. I need to make it feel right. And, yeah, it's... These are, you know, it's part of the common human experience, you know. I, I know I've, I've had those feelings and thoughts and, you know, I'm sure many people you know have as well. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. and it's interesting because even for someone who's normally quite relaxed, a certain situation or a trigger can actually, you know, put them in that control space, even though they're not normally like that. They know that's, that's an area of, like, you know, specific traumas or specific old traumas coming up to ask to be resolved and life giving you opportunities to resolve them. Yeah, because that's what life does, right? Sometimes we, <laughs> we, we assume that it's happening, you know, against us or, but it's happening yeah. for us. Mm. I think that's very important yeah. to say. Um, in terms of control, yeah. I, I mean, I could share a lot about what I did to stop wanting to control everything and everyone around me, um, but um, that was me back then. Hmm? Yeah. That's a really common, thank you for sharing that. That's such a common story, myself included, I, I have in my history. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, what can a person start to do, small practices? Uh, mm -hmm. to allow things to occur naturally and to unfold naturally. Yeah. Ah, small practices. Um, one of the easiest things you can do, and, and I teach this to a lot of women, is to 
it's, it's going to sound a little bit corny because it's just so simple, right? It, it's sometimes the simplest things are the most effective. Um, the easiest thing you can do is to practice a certain way of breathing. You know, it's, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it's just going to create that space. If your nervous system is going a little bit, or working a bit over time, it's going to give you a little bit of a breather. If you're kind of caught in that stress loop, being a perfectionist or control freak, it's going to give you that little time out and time out where you can actually go, all right, what's happening? What am I doing? And breathing exercises, you know, you're breathing in through your nose and you can do this in the, in the middle of a meeting somewhere, breathing in through your nose and then kind of just kind of almost in quietly sighing through your mouth <sighs> like that. That's one of this. That's one of the simplest things I can encourage women to do. It's breathing, but it's so much more than that because when you do that, what you're giving your nervous system a chance to do is just have that space and that little time out, you know. And I love that because you can do that on a bus. You can do that, you know, in a meeting. Um, that's one of my favorite little tricks. Another of my favorite tricks is, um, depending on where you are. Because I, I use a lot of acupressure points that are that are amazing as well, and I, I remember being in a first aid situation. This guy had fallen off his bike. He was I think he was drunk and he was thrashing around. Um, and I went up to him because I'm you know trained in first aid as well. And I just put my hand on his forehead, just here between his eyebrows. And within two seconds, he just calmed. Down. And he stayed calm for. A while. Um, after a while of holding it, people were calling me the ambulance. Um, I got my hand got tired. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take my hand off that again. So I did. And within a second, he started thrashing around again. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. I'm just going to put my hand right back there again. So that here, that's an acupressure point that's called calm the mind, calm the spirit. And what it does is just that. So if you're feeling like you need a bit of Two here, two fingers here. Yeah, um, one thumb or two fingers. This one's not so good to do when you're in the middle of a meeting, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a nice one when you're, you know, when you've had a busy day, you've got home, and and you, you want to do something other than get drunk just to, you know, slow yourself down, um, or watch lots of mind-numbing television to zone you out. This is a really nice thing. You can hold it for a few minutes. You can even do it with um, with that breathing exercise, and it just works to give your system a break and give it some time out. So. I've seen that before with EFT, which for everyone who doesn't know is emotional freedom technique. Is that the same thing? Um, it's similar because I, in from what I'm in what I am aware of, EFT is based on acupressure points, so like yeah. they can't be at the same root. Um, but with this, you don't have to tap it. You don't even have to push very hard. Please don't push very hard. You just hold quite lightly, and, and that, that does it. Um, I want to flag, though, that these things are just really like Band-Aids. You know, I, I want to, and, and many of my mentors have, have told me, you know, when you treat the symptom, sometimes when you only treat the symptom, you're actually doing that person a disservice. Because what that symptom is, what that stress is, what that anxiety and that joylessness is, is a, is a sign that something's not right. It's, just, it's your body and your soul and your true self saying, hey, wake up, hello, pay attention to something. And if we take that message away, then that person goes, oh, everything's fine. I can just keep going as I'm, go as I'm going. And like I, I believe in symptom management when things are crazy, but it's, yeah, if we only do symptom management, then that is a problem. And if we do more than symptom management, there's like the mindset, that piece there. It's, it's about changing who you are. It's about coming back to who you are, being yourself, loving yourself, and then expressing you. So, How do you interpret that message that's coming up at you with all these symptoms? <sighs> How do I inter <clears throat> how do I interpret that personally? Uh, you mean? How, how okay, so you mentioned that they were just like band-aids, right? 
How yeah. would a person know what's the real situation? Mm. You'll know what the real situation is when you come out of here and come, you know, your head and your mind and you come back into your body. And when I say your body, what I mean is your feeling, your heart feeling, your heart sense, your gut feeling, your intuition. You know, and so often when we exist just head up and only in the head, we lose our connection with that. And we lose our connection with ourselves. You know, and I, I know so many women who are perfectionists go, yeah, I, I, I want to be fulfilled and I want more connection in my life. I haven't got that. Well, the connection is how you'll actually, that, that's a start of it. What's your favorite I, tip? I'm so curious. What's your favorite tip to go from hair to hair? Mm. My everyday thing, what I do myself personally, is the breath. Mm. That, that way of I've just shared before, you know, it's, it's a reminder, come back to the body. And with that out breath, you know, with, when I'm breathing in, I can feel the tension. When I'm breathing out, it's like I'm releasing that tension. That's probably my favorite tip. It's so simple, I know, but I use it every day. And it's, it's my favorite because it can do it anywhere. And it's so easy. I'm a fan of simple elegance. So. Well, that's a beautiful, beautiful saying, and it's true. <laughs> simple elegance, I'm going to keep that. Um, <laughs> because the one thing that I've learned in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, being a recovering perfectionist, kind of like you mentioned, is choosing mm -hmm. to make things easy for myself. Yeah. Not complicating it. Um, had the habit of doing that. So whenever I see myself going a little bit more than I should, just thinking about it a little bit more than I, it's just like, okay, Nicole, it's, this is easy. What does your gut say, right? Or in whatever situation, I just repeat to myself, I choose to make this easy for me. And breathe. Yeah. And breathe. And that make, does the entire difference. So yeah. um, is there any last message that you would like to share with the audience? I think this is a beautiful, beautiful topic. I love what you just said about choice, by the way. That's so important, you know, where we choose to put our focus, what we choose um, in each moment. Thank you for sharing that. Um, last message. Yeah, it's, there's so much beauty you know, when, when we connect to our heart and when we connect to our gut and, and our body, there's actually this whole world of, of, of sensual beauty and joy. And I mean sensual in a I'm alive kind of sensual way. You know, sen the senses are alive. Um, there's so much joy and pleasure and fulfillment and connection in that, you know, and I, my invitation to women is to bring this to their lives and not just for themselves, but you know, you've, I think we've all seen women who are embodying that in the world, whether it's in people we've seen in our circles or people we've seen, you know, in different medias, um, articles or television or whatever. But when we see those women, they, they light up the area, you know, they light up the worlds that they're in. And my, my invitation is for women to, to join in that. You know, imagine bringing that to the people around you. Imagine if you have family, bring that to them. Bring that to your workplace. You know, I have this dream, this, this dream of a, a group, of a, a large group of women who are <sighs> embodied and connected in that way, achieving great things in the world in both their personal lives and their work lives and in the community. And that's what I that's that's why I do what I do, because you know, I that that's what that's what's juicy for me. Yeah, for me too. Yeah. I love what you I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's a state of being mm -hmm. and at the end yeah. of the day it's a choice that you make every day. You mm. get to choose. Yeah. You get to yeah. Choose. What will you do today? What will you embody today? You know, how will you be with? How will you choose to be with yourself when you're being vulnerable, when you're being scared? 
Beautiful. I love that choice. Thank you so much. Um, I know that you also have a gift for the audience, so if you could share a little bit about that gift, that would be awesome. Uh -huh. So I've got a little infographic that talks about, you know, this is really for perfectionists, and it goes through some information about it tells a story actually about Sarah and Jen. Jen's a perfectionist and Sarah isn't. And it goes through their stories of what life is like for them, what it feels to be them, what their resilience is, how they deal with things as they come up. So it's a little infographic and there's a little video series that comes with that as well. So yeah, I hope that's something that can be useful and, and insightful for the women who choose to download that. Thank you so much, Nikki. I loved this interview. I know that it provided a lot of value for all of the viewers out there. So check out that infographic. And I want to thank you so much once again for being here. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Nicole. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. It feels like I'm just chatting to an old friend about one of my favorite topics. <laughs> really? And I feel like we could talk about this like after an interview, too, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah. once again, I want to thank you so much, and I hope that everybody enjoyed this interview, and we'll be talking really soon. Take care. Cool. Take care.